Good morning, everybody, and welcome back. Before we continue uh, with our agenda, I understand that the permanent representative of China, Ambassador Sheng Zhu, would uh, like to say a few words because uh, the former president of China, President Jing Zemin, has passed sadly away yesterday. Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. On November the 30th, the Chinese former president, Jiang Zemin, passed away. He has been an outstanding leader, enjoyed a high prestige among all works of life in China. His passing away is an, um, a heavy loss, heavy loss to China and also to our friends all over the world. He will be remembered by the international community, by the people of China, for his dedication, for his contribution to global peace, security, and the development, for his key role in the great cause of China's economic and social development, and for his promotion of friendly cooperations with countries uh, all over the world. Many colleagues expressed deep condolences over his passing away and extended sincere sympathy to the Chinese government and people. This has been very much appreciated. If I may, Madam Chairperson, I wish to invite all present here to join me in a minute of silence in memory of the former president, Jiang Zemin. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, and my deep condolences for your loss. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, next. I have the pleasure to share a video message received from His Excellency Mr. Wilfred A. Abrahams, the Minister of Home Affairs and Information and Public Affairs of Barbados, to mark Barbados becoming a member of IOM. It was with great pleasure that I woke up this morning to a message from Michelle Klein Solomon advising me that Barbados has now been accepted officially as a member of the International Organization of Migration. I'm sorry that I could not be there with you officially to accept and to participate in the proceedings. November the 30th, 2022 marks 56 years of independence for Barbados and also our first year as a republic. So as the person in charge of the celebrations in Barbados, I could not be there but I look forward to being there next year. Barbados, while not being a member of the IOM, has long since adhered to the best practices exposed by the IOM. And as we seek to build out our capacity as a country, we are underpopulated. And we are embarking upon a managed migration policy so that we can get the skill sets that we need into Barbados and develop Barbados for the rest of the 21st century and into the future. So, Migration, immigration policies, these are front burning issues for the government of Barbados. In addition, Barbados has been one of the countries at the forefront of the fight against the climate crisis. Our Prime Minister, the Honorable Mia Amor Motley, is one of the leading voices in the world fighting against climate change and fighting for the rights of small island states, which are on the forefront of the effects of the climate crisis, while being among the least of the polluters. So the objectives and aims of IOM tend to merge directly with those of Barbados. It was interesting to note that the largest migration over the world, in the world over the last year has been climate related as opposed to war or famine or even smuggling. So our objectives align entirely with yours. While I cannot be there this year, I look forward to being there at the next meeting 
and I assure the IOM that although we are the newest member, we will be one of the most vocal and one of the most important partners that you have. So, on behalf of the government of Barbados, on behalf of my Prime Minister, on behalf of the people of Barbados, we thank you for accepting us into the family of the IOM, and we look forward to working with you. God bless you and happy independence for Barbados. Thank you. And we will now to continue our general debate. And I would like to remind speakers of the time allocated, which is three minutes for member states. To ensure the smooth running of the meeting, I would also like to request all those taking the floor to speak at a reasonable pace and to allow a accurate interpretation, in particular if delegates are participating online. In all cases, to ensure accurate and clear interpretation, copies of all statements should be submitted in advance by all delegations to the meeting secretariat before the opening of the relevant morning or afternoon session. Please also note that the full text of statements given to the Secretariat will then also be published on the IOM website, unless the meeting Secretariat is, is advised otherwise. And I now invite statements of member states. And I have the honor to first give the floor to Norway. Norway, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. Norway is proud to be a committed partner to the IOM, an organization with increased reach, influence and importance to migrants all over the world. Thank you, Director General, for a comprehensive report to the Council yesterday. We have a tough year ahead, as has already been underlined through the Standing Committee meeting, the dialogue on migration and our deliberations uh, in the Council up till today. Needs will continue to rise in 2023 as climate change, food insecurity and conflict force people into displacement in countries such as Ukraine, Pakistan, the Horn of Africa, only to name a few of the hotspots. Norway deplores the Russian aggression in Ukraine in the strongest possible way, not least its implications for forced migration. We receive echoes from the field that the IOM staff in Ukraine is providing not only crucial support, but coordination and is representing the UN and the best of our goodwill for the Ukrainian people. We are honored to be sharing in the funding of your operations in Ukraine. We recognize the difficult circumstances that the staff on the ground are experiencing. Norway has donated civilian, military and humanitarian support to Ukraine and we're supporting the neighboring countries who are shouldering the burden of the increased displacement. This week we were able to bolster our support to IOM on further in this globally devastating crisis. Norway supports and recognizes the important work that has been put down this year to reform the organization, organizationally and financially. We welcome the budget reforms and the strengthening of core functions. We request continued updates on the implementation of the reforms, as well as further, risk on, further work on risk management and results-based approaches in the entirety of the organization. We also need to continue to emphasize the need for audit and oversight, as well as systems to implement our common zero tolerance for sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment. Norwegian partners to the IOM have taken note of improvements in the management of our bilateral agreements, reflecting the increased capacity of the organization. On our side as a donor, we are committed to provide pluriannual non-earmarked support in line with our intention to provide continuity, predictability and flexibility for the organization. As a host society for migrants and refugees, Norway has the responsibility to facilitate and regulate legal pathways and inclusion into the Norwegian society and our labor market. We also need to work towards common, responsible and efficient return policies 
so that irregular migration doesn't undermine the positive legal migration. Our government has put into place an initiative which endeavours to address support to displaced populations and their host communities simultaneously. In order to address internal displacement, forced migration and to discourage, discourage secondary movements and prevent irregular migration, we need to build resilience and create sustainable livelihoods in host communities, whether they are in countries of origin or transit. Reflecting many of the statements of this Council up till today, we need to work out the humanitarian development peace nexus in practice in the field if we are able to address the complex migratory challenges ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And may I very kindly uh, remind delegates taking the floor to stick to the speaking time of three minutes. And with this in mind, I have the honor to give the floor to the um, distinguished representative of Panama, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Members of the Council, I would like to highlight the work of the ILO to respond to the current and future migration challenges. Uh, as member states, we need to join our efforts to overcome the challenges and through a joint uh, cooperation achieve our goals. Migration is a long-standing and constant phenomenon and we cannot be indifferent to it. Uh, most certainly economic liberation creates a greater demand for labour to increase productivity and therefore a massive movement of people looking for better living conditions. Due to these interconnections, migration is beneficial when it is safe, orderly and regular. However, the increase of irregular migrants, which we currently face, means that we need a better and greater global and regional coordination to ensure it is sustainable. Around 4% of the global population migrates uh, with the hope of a better life. And despite the fact that each uh, region has various and different scenarios, the reality is that in Latin America we are witness to a, an unprecedented movement of irregular migrants. Official data on migration in Panama shows that this year, more than 220,000 migrants have entered the country by the Darien region, transiting to North America. The current uh, migration crisis, uh, which uh, Panama does not escape, uh, reaches record figures. And we offer full and comprehensive assistance to people on the move, implementing various strategies and projects uh, for the reception of migrants, uh, and we provide healthcare assistance, uh, food, and data collection at these points. With a strategic position, we build bridges of collaboration with the various actors so that the assistance uh, on migration is done from a humanitarian perspective. And that's going to be our greatest objective, when in 2023 we will continue and make uh, real the work of the Regional Conference for Migration in the pro tempore presidency. We will privilege and prioritise joint work based on shared responsibility so that we provide full and comprehensive assistance to ensure migration is safe, orderly and regular. Led by a humanitarian approach, Panama offers food, refuge and health care to migrants who arrive and transit through our territory, searching for a better future. It's essential that we strengthen the spirit of collective solidarity as well as shared responsibility, and all countries, be they of origin, transit or destination, must work in coordination on these challenges. America, Latin America is one of the regions that's most affected by mass migration, which unfortunately is encouraged by 
international organized crime, which uh, works on people trafficking, smuggling of migrants, and other crimes, and puts at risk and danger the lives of thousands of people every day. It's urgent that we adopt long-lasting solutions to these threats. Migration is a global phenomenon that we cannot stop, but which we can regulate suitably to ensure that we have orderly and safe flows. That is the aim and goal of Panama, working as a champion country of the Global Compact. I call on the creation of more spaces for multilateral, constructive dialogue between states and international organizations so that we can ensure the joint implementation of sustainable strategies to ensure there is a humanitarian treatment which risk, minimizes risk to life and safety. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Turkey. Turkey, you have the floor. Um, Mr. Director General, Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear chairperson, First of all, like others before me, I would like to start by congratulating you on assuming the role of chairperson of the Council. Uh, Turkey hosts the second largest IAM global mission which supports our migration management through joint projects and activities. We consider IAM as a strong and reliable partner since the 90s. Turkey continues to be the world's largest refugee hosting country since 2014. Unfortunately, after 11 years, the protracted situation in Syria is still affecting the lives of millions of Syrians. IOM, along with our national authorities, plays a crucial role in extending a life-saving assistance to Syrians in need, as well as other vulnerable groups. We value a lot the work of the IAM. Turkey has actively contributed to the GCM since its inception. As the champion countries, we remain committed to implement the GCM objectives through our national framework. The number of forcibly displaced people reach an unprecedented level in the world. New challenges such as extreme weather events, food insecurity, ongoing wars and conflicts are causing more and more displacement. We welcome the IAM reform, which will increase IAM's ability to adapt itself to new challenges. We understand that the high-level segment of the Council was a fruitful stock-taking discussion on the nexus between climate change, food security, migration, and displacement. It's certain that the outcome of this valuable discussion will contribute to the IAM works in the future. Distinguished guests, the surge of food and energy prices causes inflation and the risk of malnutrition, even hunger. The damaged supply routes are yet to fully recover. Since the beginning of the war in Ukraine, our position has been clear. We remain steadfast in our commitment to Ukraine's independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. We continue to provide strong political, humanitarian, and technical support to Ukraine. Simultaneously, we have been engaging with both sides diplomatically. The Istanbul Grain Agreement, dealt between the parties and brokered by Turkey and the UN, proves the value of the diplomatic track. Thanks to the Black Sea Grain Initiative, more than 12 million tons of grain products have reached the world markets. It provides lowest income countries access to products. It also reduces grain prices internationally. Thanks to our diplomatic efforts with the UN, the agreement has been successfully extended for another four months. Dear colleagues, extreme weather conditions are increasingly driving displacement. This year only, millions of people in Pakistan and Somalia have been affected by floods and droughts. We see climate change as a risk multiplier for countries. Therefore, our efforts to address climate change should include adaptation and resilience building support to affected countries. Dear colleagues, lastly, I would like to reiterate Turkey's commitment to strengthening migration governance in solidarity with the international community. With this understanding, Turkey will continue to support IAM's efforts and the UN system on migration-related issues. Thank you. Thank you. And I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Chairperson, Excellencies, heads of delegations, 
distinguished delegates. Zimbabwe aligns itself with the statement delivered by Nigeria on behalf of the Africa Group. Chairperson, I would like to commend you for the excellent manner in which you are presiding over our deliberations. Zimbabwe would like to express appreciation to the IOM Director General, Mr. Antonio Vitorino, for his report, which provides a good basis for this general debate. Having followed with interest the issues raised by the DG, which resonates with the statements articulated by member states during the high-level segment, Zimbabwe wishes to highlight the following areas for consideration in line with the IOM strategic vision for 2019 to 2023 under the areas of resilience, mobility, and governance. Chair, with respect to resilience, it is important for us to invest in the early warning systems and preparedness to anticipate crisis. In this sense, disaster risk reduction strategies must also include forced migration mitigation measures. There is also a need to put risk reduction measures in place so that communities can be more resilient to the shocks of climate change. And this would best be done by designing and implementing solutions in an integrated manner that includes early warning systems and community capacity strengthening. These are crucial preventive measures to the effects of climate-induced forced migration. Regarding mobility chairperson, the government of Zimbabwe recognizes that there is, growing, there is a growing concern of migration and human mobility in Africa, given that the relationship between migration, environment, and climate change is highly complex. The dynamics of climate change coupled with population changes in migration and their intricate relationship with development are amongst the most pressing challenges that continue to dom dominate Africa's social economic development discourse. In this regard, IOM should assist in migration flow monitoring within countries and across borders. Under governance, in order for us to effectively manage the effects of climate change, chair, climate change induced migration and food security, it is important to invest in strengthening the capacity of member states to come up with institutional frameworks for migration governance. In Zimbabwe, IOM has been working closely with the Civil Protection Unit in ensuring that the system in, is prepositioned to respond to emergencies and disasters that could result in forced displacement of communities. In addition, migrant resource centers have been established at ports of entry and exit to provide pre-departure information and familiarization for migrants and sustainable reintegration packages for returnees to strengthen house, the household economy. These institutional frameworks are designed to mainstream age and gender, and we therefore urge the IOM to continue providing both technical and financial support to member states. Moreover, it is important to build and expand partnerships with other UN agencies dealing with human mobility, such as the UNHCR. Other important stakeholders include communities, private, private players, and the diaspora we have a stake in the migration management discourse. Chairperson, with the respect to the issues raised by the Director General under labor migration policy reforms, Zimbabwe wishes to highlight the importance of ethical recruitment, which allows for the safe and orderly movement of migrants. As a country, already implementing an ethical recruitment project, we call upon the IOM to increase its support to both migrant sending and receiving countries. In conclusion, Chairperson, Zimbabwe is of the considered view that if migration is to be effectively managed, the development-related imperatives need to be joined. And for us, this relates to the agricultural development, access to better trading opportunities for developing countries, and providing funding to mitigate the effects of climate change as articulated during COP27. Finally, Chair, we wish to convey our deepest condolences to the, Republic, to the People's Republic of China on the sad passing of their former president, His Excellency Jiang Zemin. 
May he so rest in peace. I thank you. Thank you. And I now have the honor to give the floor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Hungary. Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, dear Director General, thanks for uh, convening this meeting under very complicated times when uh, we have been uh, faced with uh, tremendous um, challenges. Um, among these challenges, the most uh, severe ones are the uh, security-related uh, um, challenges, the war in Ukraine and the um, growing pressure of uh, illegal migration hitting the uh, European uh, continent. Because of our geography, uh, Hungary has been faced with uh, these challenges in a simultaneous manner. As we are neighbors to Ukraine, the impacts of the war are severe and immediate on us. We have been carrying out the largest humanitarian operation ever in our history, as more than a million refugees have already entered the territory of uh, Hungary, and we give them all the necessary help, obviously, as we guarantee equal access both to health care and uh, education to them. So refugee kids and students have been enrolled in more than 1,300 schools and kindergartens in Hungary already. And we will continue this um, policy of ours, obviously, as long as it is needed, although I have to tell you that the outlook is terrible because a harsh winter is coming, which can cause a huge humanitarian catastrophe. So when, if not now, we should urge peace to come as soon as possible and warn those who... Um, who rather fuel the escalation instead of um, helping to stop the war, that they should think about those families and those children who have to live without having a safe supply of electricity, thus heating and hot water. Winter is coming and peace must come. So we are neighbors of Ukraine to the east, but in the meantime, we protect the external border of the European Union to the south. And this border of ours is without exaggeration under siege. Under siege because we had to stop 255,000 illegal migrants only this year. And I can tell you that there's a new dimension of uh, violence and aggression as these uh, migrants are now carrying weapons just like their traffickers. And they are using uh, those weapons on each other, on the border guards, and very recently shooting on police officers on the territory of Hungary as well. And we also experience a growing number of traffickers, which shows that this is becoming a widespreading uh, business. Uh, our authorities have started procedures against 1,500 traffickers only this year. And after a temporary slowdown in the recent years, we see the numbers uh, unfortunately growing very rapidly. So the number of uh, migrants are there where they used to be on the peak back in 2015. So I think there's one thing, um, uh, Madam Chair, um, Ambassador, what we have to make clear is that international law must be respected and must be applied by all. Which means that if one is forced to uh, escape from his or her home, then he or she is entitled by international law to stay temporary on the territory of the first safe country. But no one is entitled to pick a country uh, of taste where he or she would like to live in and no one is entitled to violate borders between safe countries. So crossing a border illegally between two safe countries is a violation of a border, which is a crime. A crime and not a human right. And all countries do have the right to make their decision on their own, whom they would like to allow to enter and whom not. And we Hungarians are the best example in this regard. We are a direct neighbor to Ukraine. So for those who have to escape from Ukraine, we are the first safe country. And based on that, we of course allow all of them to enter the territory of Hungary. But for those who are violating our border from the south, we are not the first safe country because they have to go through minimum five, six safe countries until they get to the Hungarian border. So they have no right to cross borders between safe countries. And we will of course always protect the territory of our country uh, complying with our national and European obligations. And I think that the, uh, the policy uh, coming from Brussels, which uh, encourages migration, should be stopped as well. And the European countries should be supported to um, be able to protect their own territories and the territory of the European Union as well. Pro-migration policy is dangerous, 
and uh, pro-migration policy also supports the business scheme of traffickers who make huge money, millions of dollars, on putting uh, lives of people at risk. So I think we should do two things in this regard. First, we should call things on their real names. And those so-called NGOs uh, who are carrying uh, people uh, through borders uh, between uh, peaceful and safe countries, or those NGOs who put lives of people at risk at the Mediterranean, they should be called who they are. They are traffickers. And traffickers commit crime, and we should um, uh, approach to them accordingly. And we should not let anyone to put pressure on any country to allow people to enter who do not have rights to enter. And second, we do have to tackle the root causes. And we have to create circumstances which will um, make people not to make a decision to leave uh, from their own homes. So, dear colleagues, during the debate we had in New York and here on the Global Compact on Migration, we made it very, very clear, and unfortunately, I have to say that it has already been proved that migration can be a very dangerous phenomenon. And in Europe, we are not capable to handle two security-related severe challenges simultaneously, war and uh, a growing pressure of illegal migration. So, and we all know that the migratory flaws uh, can um, easily form a vicious circle with a growing threat of terror as well. So we have to be, I think, uh, very um, strong on respecting and on applying international law. Finally, I would like to express uh, the appreciation on behalf of the government of Hungary for all the activities uh, which have been carried out and led by Director General Antonio Vitorino. And uh, I hope I not ruin your chances entirely by saying that you have the support of the Hungarian government to be re-elected for your second term. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I now invite the Director General um, for his comments. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. First of all, let me convey the condolences to the, the People's Republic uh, of China. And uh, I, I will just very uh, briefly say that uh, uh, I thank all the support of uh, Norway, and I want to emphasize the key role that Norway plays in leading the agenda on internally displacement uh, worldwide. And we look forward to the output of the work of the Special Advisor on IDPs uh, and going on counting with uh, your uh, support, as well as we appreciate particularly the support of Norway to the uh, IOM's operations in Ukraine, which are critical not just from the humanitarian point of view, but also in the perspective of building the resilience in the communities. Uh, in relation to uh, uh, Panama... As regards uh, Panama, I would like uh, to wish you the best success uh, in uh, your chairing uh, pro tempore of the Regional Conference on Migration. And we would like to underscore that we will continue working together in a very challenging context that uh, we are witnessing in the Darien region. In fact, uh, by the end of October 2022, there were more than 200,000 migrants uh, that had passed through Darien. And we know that this has a very considerable impact on the entire country. And we, as IOM, will continue to cooperate with the government so that we can deal with this uh, very large migratory flow. Uh, I would like to uh, express uh, my appreciation for the efforts, the diplomatic efforts that Turkey has been developing in terms of the Black Sea Grain uh, Initiative in which IOM is uh, participating as well as the entire UN uh, system and uh, also in the implementation of the strategy document and national action plan to fight irregular migration from 2021 to 2025. And a part that we remain committed to support uh, Turkey's government in uh, uh, facing uh, the world's largest refugee population in uh, one uh, country, uh, coming mainly from Syria. In terms of the, the Zimbabwe, I can uh, reiterate that uh, we go on engaged in supporting our member states in building capacity to confront climate change and its impact in human mobility, 
setting up early warning systems, uh, disaster risk reductions, and building the resilience in the communities so that people eat by climate change, does not have to move, does not have to migrate, that is prepared to confront uh, with uh, the impacts in their livelihoods of uh, uh, slow on uh, degradation of the environment or extreme weather events. And from our side, you can go on counting on our capacity, building mechanisms, particularly our ACBC center based in Moshi in Tanzania. And uh, in relation to uh, Hungary, I would uh, emphasize uh, our appreciation for the support that uh, Hungary is providing to the Ukrainian refugees in the framework of the Temporary Protection Di Directive. I agree with you that the winter and the impacts of the shelling of the electricity facilities in um, uh, Ukraine may generate a new wave of uh, movement and refugees towards the Western countries, and IOM is working uh, in, uh, with the rest of the UN system on contingency planning for that possible scenario. And when it comes to the southern borders, uh, I do acknowledge the growth of the migratory pressure on the southern border. border. And uh, uh, two, one and a half ago, I was in uh, Skopje in North Macedonia, bringing to the, together the six uh, parties in the region uh, in order to establish a, mini a ministerial declaration where those countries have committed not only to improve their border controls, uh, aligning their visa policy to the policy of the European Union, but also uh, in order to uh, cooperate with countries of origin to improve uh, voluntary return and uh, readmission uh, uh, agreements. Thank you. Thank you. And I now have the honor to give the floor to the distinguished representative of Bangladesh. Bangladesh, you have the floor. Madam Chair, Director General and Deputy Directors General, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, good morning to all of you. Let me begin by welcoming Ambassador Lasana for assuming the chair of the IOM Council and Madam Chair yourself for eff efficiently officiating in his place. We appreciate the leadership of Ambassador Madam Catalina Demandas during the last year. We congratulate Barbados uh, for being the newest member of the IOM. We commend the Director General for presenting a comprehensive report and updates on the activities and priorities of the IOM. Madam Chair, Bangladesh, as a migrant sending country, a host of over 1 million forcibly displaced Myanmar nationals, and a climate vulnerable country, works with IOM in different areas of its operation. From this experience, we underline the continued importance of IOM in quality human mobility and robust migration governance. In June this year, we joined the consensus on the significant budget reform. Bangladesh had earlier demonstrated her commitment and made significant contribution to the migration emergency funding mechanism despite her own constraints. We believe this recent reform will help make it the IOM more agile, fit for purpose, and efficient. Madam Chair, regrettably, politics of fear and mistrust are increasingly influencing the international migration discourse at a time of rise of extreme nationalism. Migrants are facing negative stereotyping and continue to face multifarious challenges in their destination countries. IOM needs to enhance its activities in protecting uh, migrants and particularly migrant workers' rights in destination countries. And this is more so in the event of unforeseen shocks and emergencies. We also look forward to IOM's continued leadership in the broader implementation of the Global Compact on Migration in the coming years. Madam Chair, we appreciate IOM for arranging the high-level segment, focusing the interlinkages between climate change, food security, migration, and development. We hope that momentum of this high-level segment would be carried forward by the Global Forum on Migration and Development and other relevant platforms towards creating an appropriate framework to address the needs of climate migrants. The Sharm el-Sheikh implementation plan, recently uh, adopted at the conference of the parties of the UNFCCC, 
has accepted devastating impact on the lives and livelihood of local communities, which lead to displacement and human mobility, both internally and externally. We would encourage the IOM to take advantage of this consensus and push its own strategic objectives, as has been agreed, at the Institutional Strategy on Migration, Environment and Climate Change for the decade 2021-2030. We'd expect IOM to show due determination on development of, number one, solution for people to move, including ethical recruitment of labor migrants and simplification of migration systems. Number two, solutions for the people on the move, including protecting rights of migrants. And number three, solutions for people to stay in their original places of abode, including addressing the drivers and triggers of displacement and forced displacement. Uh, Madam Chair, we demand a rights-based approach and human security approach to guide IOM's operation towards quality migration in the post-pandemic era. This is more needed in the time of deepening social unrest and conflicts, as well as climate-related disasters and resultant displacements. I thank you. Thank you. And I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Estonia. Estonia, you have the floor. Chair, Director General, Excellencies, distinguished delegates. Estonia aligns itself with a statement delivered by the European Union on behalf of the EU and its member states. I would like to thank the Director General for his statement and the update on IOM's current activities. Estonia appreciates IOM's growing role as a global leader on migration and an irreplaceable partner in the international humanitarian system. We strongly count on IOM's vast experience and the network of missions and dedicated experts on the ground. This year, we come together in, in the face of grievous challenges as armed conflict, violence, persecution, climate change, economic uncertainty and food insecurity are all on rise. The humanitarian situation worldwide, including with reference to migrants and internally displaced persons around the globe, is deeply concerning. This demands new solutions such as innovative projects joining humanitarian development and peace efforts, as well as anticipatory action and resilience building. Closer to us, Russia's unprovoked and unjustified war of aggression against Ukraine has led to the worst refugee and humanitarian crisis in Europe since the Second World War. Over 7 million people are currently internally displaced in Ukraine, and more than 7.5 million have fled the country, most of them women and children. The impact of Russian aggression reaches much further, causing energy crisis and rise in food insecurity and food prices all around the world, being particularly harsh on already fragile countries. Only through international cooperation we have managed to mitigate the destabilizing effects of the war on the global food markets. We must not forget, as long as Russia is continuing the war of aggression, the illegal annexation of Ukrainian regions and the violation of international law, global security is at risk. Estonia commends IOM for supporting the protection and transit of Ukrainian citizens and residents and providing acute life-saving support on the ground. Estonia is doing its part to help and share the burden. To date, Estonia has sent an estimated 23 million euro in humanitarian aid to Ukraine. We are currently hosting a number of Ukrainian refugees equal to more than 4.7% of our population. At the same time, the challenging situation of irregular migrants in the world remains a high concern for us. It demands making the very best use of our resources to be able to assist the most vulnerable in need. A holistic approach to migration management is essential to avoid the situation where irregular, irregular migrants' uh, lives are put in danger or lost. Estonia prioritizes addressing the root causes of migration, facilitating return and reintegration, creating favorable living conditions at home, fighting against smuggling and human trafficking as vital elements of a comprehensive approach. Furthermore, we need to develop new and enhance the existing partnerships with countries of origin and transit for migration. Let me conclude by reiterating Estonia's appreciation and support for the vital role and work of IOM. I want to salute IOM staff for their dedication and professionalism, and we look forward to continuing our cooperation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ambassador. 
And I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of the Holy See. Holy See, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. At the outset, allow me to extend to Barbados, on behalf of the Holy See, a warm welcome to the IOM family. Congratulations on your admission to this important organization. Last year, in a message to this council on the occasion of IOM's 70th anniversary, Pope Francis said that, quote, migrants are increasingly being used as bargaining chips, as pawns on a chessboard, victims of political rivalries. As we all know, the decision to emigrate, to leave one's homeland or territory of origin, is undoubtedly one of the most difficult decisions in life, end quote. Unfortunately, the international situation does not seem to have improved since then. Human suffering and desperation continue to be exploited in order to defend and even advance political agendas. Without ignoring the political and legal aspects of irregular migration, we must never lose sight of the human face of migration and the fact that, beyond the geographical divisions of borders, we are part of a single human family. Migrants are more than numbers or part of a quota to meet each year. While their integration is challenging and states must cooperate to properly manage mixed flows, it is important to remember that behind the statistics are persons no different from our own family members and friends. In this regard, the Holy See wishes to ask the Council to pause and reflect on the language frequently used in political and policy debates about migration. For instance, burden sharing, redistribution, and reallocation. Such expressions are inherently reductive and characterize migrants, refugees, and asylum seeker seekers as commodities or liabilities. Madam Chair, the root causes of migration and forced displacement call into question our achievements as a human family, including the area, area of social justice. While states are obligated to respect the human rights and fundamental freedoms of people on the move, it is also crucial that the international community help create conditions which allow communities and individuals to live in safety and dignity in their countries of origin, consistent with paragraph 13 of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. In this regard, it is past time to acknowledge that when people must flee, it is not enough to encourage increased coordination among states in the area of their search and rescue, disembarkation, and resettlement. Instead, there's a serious need to reconsider and reform the current approach to managing mixed flows at international borders and at sea. If not, the current chaos that results in countless acts of violence, abuse, and increasing loss of life, particularly in the Mediterranean, will only get worse. Madam Chair, notwithstanding the complexities that come with migration, the perceived challenges must not obscure the opportunities and contributions offered by migrants. Migration has to be approached with confidence as an opportunity to build peace and not as a threat. In this regard, the importance of integration in a spirit of mutual knowledge and reciprocal openness and respect cannot be stressed enough. This includes the laws and traditions of the host countries, which should always encourage a culture of encounter and solidarity. In closing, confronted by the numerous challenges of contemporary migration and forced displacement, cooperation and solidarity should be the watchwords for this council and its members. State policy responses should be centered on safety and the protection of human dignity and life. They should be concerned with the well-being of countries and citizens, but also take into account the needs of the most vulnerable, especially in our increasingly interconnected world. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And I now have the honor to give the floor to Cote d'Ivoire, Ambassador. Madam President. Madam Chair, Cote d'Ivoire would like to support the declaration made by Nigeria on behalf of the Africa Group, and would also like to address the Congratulations on your election to the head of the Council Bureau. We would also like to congratulate the members of the Bureau and wish you all the best in carrying out your mandate. Furthermore, Cote d'Ivoire would also like to welcome Barbados as a new member of our common organization. Madam Chair, my delegation would like to thank the Director General for presenting his uh, annual report, which was comprehensive, because it better it allows us to better understand the problems linked to human mobility and the challenges linked to it. We would also like to congratulate him on his leadership and the excellent work that he's carried out on migratory issues in a challenging context. In fact, as was indicated in the report, migratory flows have reached record levels uh, because of multifaceted crises uh, such as armed conflicts, uh, food insecurity, the persistence of effects of COVID-19 and climate change. And that is why we welcome the high-level debate that took place at the beginning of this session, which looked at the correlations between these uh, issues of great concern. Uh, 
in this uh, debate. Uh, we are promoting an innovative approaches uh, to prevent, prepare and respond to environmental challenges. It is urgent that we ensure that there is greater solidarity and international cooperation, particularly for developing countries that are most affected by this. Uh, Côte d'Ivoire has itself uh, initiated a programme to fight against climate change and we aim to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 28% uh, by 2030. And we have also launched a programme to invest uh, in forestry through intensive uh, reforestation. These initiatives should be able to contribute to improving the living conditions of our populations in the country. We would like to thank uh, the IOM for its constant support uh, to the country through the Development Fund, which has allowed us to fund the following project, uh, developing the government's capacities to re for the ethical recruitment and protection of migrant workers uh, in the food and agricultural uh, supply chains. Uh, furthermore, my country welcomes um, all the actions that have been carried out by the Director General and uh, the IOM personnel to provide assistance to migrants across the world. Uh, we would also like to say how satisfied we are in uh, the uh, fulfillment of the govern internal government's um, framework of the ILM, which has allowed us to have a constructive dialogue between the states uh, and to look at priorities for financing. Uh, furthermore, Cote d'Ivoire would like to welcome uh, the ILM, IOM's work uh, in uh, establishing migratory policies uh, that as part of the institutional frameworks uh, of the 2030 United Nations agen uh, 2030 Agenda. To conclude, my delegation would like uh, to call on member states uh, to strengthen cooperation and international solidarity so that we can find lasting solutions to migratory problems. Uh, we would like uh, to reaffirm our government's engagement uh, to work with the IOM so that we can achieve our mandate. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. And I now have the honor to give the floor to the distinguished representative of Peru. Peru, you have the floor. Muchas gracias. Muy buenos días. Thank you very much. And a uh, very good day, Madam Vice-Chair. As it's the first time that I am speaking, I would like to express our congratulation to Her Excellency on her election as uh, Vice-Chair of the Council for the f coming year. And we also extend our congratulations to Ambassador Lasana Guerreri, President of the Council, Chair of the Council and Ambassador Lee as Second Vice-Chair. For Peru, it's an honor to be elected as rapporteur, which consolidates our willingness to contribute to the growth of the organization. We thank uh, member states for their trust in us. We would also like to thank the Director General for the annual report and the Secretariat of the IOM for organizing this meeting. Chair. The new migratory currents have made Peru a country of destination and transit for migrants and have uh, posed new challenges to m migration management, which have to be seen from a regional and global perspective. Therefore, the state in Peru has been developing an active role in mechanisms such as the Andean Community and the Organization of American State, and in specialist fora such as the South American Conference on Migration, which uh, Peru has uh, taken on the pro tempore presidency of, as well as working in the Quito process. Our national migration policy has uh, four central pillars which include Peruvians living abroad, Peruvians who wish to emigrate, Peruvians returning, and all foreign citizens in our country. The efforts of the state of Peru to include migrants in our society is one where the IOM has played a supporting role to the government of Peru. The activities carried out include the emergency response program for migrants and refu refugees from Venezuelans in Peru and the proposal to uh, add Peru to the coverage of the assisted voluntary return program and the development of the second uh, survey of the Venezuelan uh, population and the second survey of the Peruvian community abroad. I would also like to mention 
our willingness and availability to uh, work for the implementation of the Global Compact on Migration. Peru participated at the first international forum on uh, first forum on international migration this year and uh, presented a report on the Global Compact for safe, orderly, and regular migration in Latin America and the Caribbean, which will be used at the United Nations Network on Migration. And uh, we became a precursor country in the start of the implementation of the Global Compact. I would like to repeat our commitment to migrants, which was expressed by the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Peru at the high-level segment uh, before this general debate. I'd like to express our wishes for every success uh, for the IOM and uh, for strong leadership, in particular for the benefit of migrants in need and in the most affected regions. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, and congratulations to your election as well from my side. I now invite the Director General for his comments. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. First of all, I would like to um, express to Bangladesh our appreciation for the continued cooperation as uh, the host country of over one million Rohingya refugees in Cox Bazar uh, district and more recently also in the Basan Shar uh, island. We are fully committed to support you and to raise awareness of the international community about the protracted nature of the crisis in Cox's Bazar, the Rohingya crisis in Cox's Bazar, and the need to have the mobilization of the necessary resources to assist uh, such uh, huge uh, population of uh, uh, refugees. I would also like to emphasize that uh, Bangladesh is on the forefront of the uh, fight against climate change and mobilizing uh, all the climate vulnerability for member states uh, to uh, lead the way towards uh, COP27. And uh, we appreciate very much uh, the contribution of Bangladesh to the debates uh, in COP27. Allow me also a personal reference to your former ambassador in New York Ambassador uh, Rabab Fatima, who had a critical role to play in the progress declaration of the International Migration Review uh, Forum. In relation to Estonia, I would like to reiterate our commitment to support uh, Estonia as a frontline country because of the war in Ukraine in uh, uh, the uh, application of the Temporary Protection uh, Directive. Uh, including the access of the beneficiaries of TPD to public services like health, labor, and uh, education, which represents, of course, a significant pressure in the Estonian uh, society, and we are ready to pursue our uh, support. In relation to the OEC, I want to emphasize uh, the privilege I had to meet with His Holiness the Pope last uh, September and uh, to share with His Holiness our concerns about uh, the situation of uh, the migrants in the Mediterranean, particularly the need to have a more proactive uh, uh, activity in terms of search and rescue. The figures of the people dying in the central Mediterranean route are extremely high. Of course, one death would be high but the uh, 1,200 deaths that we have registered this year is extremely high, and this requires measures of support as well as uh, measures to support all migrants in distress. And we work all over the world with the important network of the Catholic Church uh, providing uh, support and protection to uh, migrants. En ce qui concerne la for Côte d'Ivoire, first of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, Côte d'Ivoire on their pioneer role in terms of migration within the uh, west uh, sub-region of Africa and the support that has all and emphasis that's always been given to climate change and its impact on human mobility. And I'd like to stress the importance of the, the forest program, which is a contribution of Côte d'Ivoire 
to the fight against climate change. And I'd also like to reassure you that all of our action for migration management are aligned with the uh, sustainable development uh, goals of the uh, uh, 2030 agenda and the African Union's agenda. And to conclude, I wanted to congratulate the ambassador of Peru on uh, his election to the Bureau and repeat our actions in Peru for the regularization of uh, foreigners resident in the country, in particular refugees and migrants from Venezuela, as well as the importance that we uh, accord to the second uh, global survey of Peruvians abroad, which is essential to work on the collaboration and contribution of the Peruvian diaspora to the development of the country. And finally, I would like to congratulate you on the pro-temporary chairmanship of the South American Conference uh, for Migration uh, starting in November. And uh, we'd like to congratulate you and assure you of our support. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now have the honor to give the floor to the distinguished representative of Tunisia. Tunisia, you have the floor. Merci, Madame. Thank you, Madam Chair, Director General. Tunisia uh, aligns itself with the statements made by Nigeria and Egypt on behalf of the African group and the Arab group. I would also like to use this opportunity to congratulate uh, Barbados and welcome them on joining the organization. I thank the Director General for his opening remarks and his comprehensive report on the various activities and progress made by the organization. Chair, the IOM has been particularly in demand this year and has seen its activities diversify and increase. This situation is likely to continue due to several factors, including conflict, uh, economic difficulties, and climate change. Whilst uh, welcoming the emergency humanitarian response of the IOM and its staff throughout the world, we believe it's necessary for the organization to redouble efforts in the area of preventive measures and long-term solutions. So we note with satisfaction within this area the initiative of the IOM to strengthen its contribution to international efforts uh, in, cl in fighting climate change. Uh, we will also remember from this year the holding of the first uh, International Migration Review Forum, which allowed heads of state and government to repeat and renew their commitment to the global compact uh, for safe, orderly and regular migration and to identify the challenges that countries face in implementing the compact. At this uh, forum, Tunisia, Tunisia presented an updated report on its activities and in particular to cover all the goals of the compact and we also set out the main progress made with its implementation. The Tunisian authorities have also published this year a first inquiry on international migration which aims to fill gaps in terms of data. This study is an essential step and is a valuable tool for setting up uh, efficient governance of migration and for drawing up policies and strategies for migration on a more global level. Tunisia has also intensified its efforts and cooperation on a bilateral level to ensure that there is uh, putting into place of safe and regular migration paths uh, which will guarantee the respect of the rights of migrant workers and their socio-economic integration. In accordance with our commitments, the Tunisian authorities have played a significant role in the rescue at sea of migrants and the preservation of their rights and dignity. So Tunisia within this calls for a greater solidarity and highlights the absolute necessity to intensify international action in order to 
tackle the real causes of irregular migration, which have worsened in recent times. It's uh, time to uh, uh, to adopt a global approach which is solid, shows solidarity in the treatment of the matter. That's why it's ever more urgent, given the growth uh, of this uh, trafficking network, that we work and reflect further on developing efficient and innovative mechanisms to tackle the issue. And I'd like to conclude in uh, assuring you of the support of Tunisia, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And I now have the honor to give the floor to the distinguished representative of Mexico. Vielen Dank, Frau Präsidentin. Thank you, Madam Chair. My delegation would like to congratulate uh, Ambassador Ansanagiri on his election, and you have all our support. We also thank the Director General for his report. Thank you. In 2022, we have seen a year with major challenges on the migratory agenda, and there are more than enough examples to illustrate situations of vulnerability that continue to affect migrants and the impact that it has on the enjoyment of human rights. The scale and complexity of contemporary migration, characterized by mixed migratory flows, has also been a major challenge for the capacities of states. It's only when we work together with a spirit of cooperation and shared responsibility and with the support of multilateral organizations such as the IOM, can we make reality the vision of the Marrakesh Pact in achieving safe, orderly and regular migration? This multilateral vocation brought results at the International Review of Migration. This declaration is a clear expression of the policy and will of states to join to create uh, transcendental changes to the management of migration. We encourage the IOM in continuing to support countries with the efficient implementation. When we look at uh, various studies, we can see that uh, the causes that lead to migration and uh, migratory movement, in particular those of unsafe routes and irregular routes, uh, Climate change, for example, is one that has visible and deep effects as an accelerator of migration across all regions. We need to avoid a, a scenario which uh, needs uh, two efforts on two fronts. On the one hand, we need better channels for regular migration, but we also have many examples of labor and academic mobility and mechanisms for regularization and family reunification that have been successful. We also need to deal with the causes that force people to migrate. In addition to the Marrakesh Agreement, the international community has other major frameworks such as the Agenda 2030, the Sendai Framework and the Paris Agreement, which set out roadmaps to achieve an inclusive and sustainable development that leaves no one behind. We welcome the advance of COP27 in Egypt, in particular, in the area of loss and damage, which will help to contribute to the migration agenda. And we hope these uh, com commitments will contribute to increase uh, resilience in vulnerable communities. And to conclude, we would like to repeat the importance of counting on a solid, efficient, and capacity-laden IOM. This year, we managed to uh, put through budget reform. However, we still have other areas pending on internal governance, and we need to continue working on these. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now have the honor to give the floor to the distinguished representative of the Philippines. Thank you, Madam Chair. We congratulate you on your election as chair of the IOM Council. Please be assured that you have the Philippines' full support during your tenure. We also thank the Director General for his report. The Philippines aligns itself with the joint statement of the Asia-Pacific Group delivered by the Republic of Korea. Madam Chair, 
As members of the community of nations, it is incumbent upon member states to continue to provide the IOM with the proper foundations and adequate resources to fulfill the mandate of upholding the rights and welfare of migrants. The budget reform signals our ability to cooperate despite differences, to weigh in despite respective internal challenges. Our advocacy for global burden and responsibility sharing informed our support for the budget reform, as well as our modest but consistent more voluntary contributions to the Migration Multipartner Trust Fund and the Migration Emergency Funding Mechanism. We believe that there is an opportunity for all stakeholders, traditional and non-traditional donors alike, to heed the Director General's call for resources to support the IOM's robust global operations and for critical work such as emergency humanitarian assistance. We understand that recent international developments, including the war in Ukraine, other armed conflicts, and extreme weather conditions brought about by climate change have driven an increased movement and displacement of people. This reality has therefore placed demands on organizations such as the IOM to increase presence on the ground in situations of conflict and disasters. In mitigating involuntary migration, our vision must require coordinated actions, both in addressing climate change and having the political will to resolve conflicts that prolong and complicate humanitarian situations. Madam Chair, in order to address contemporary migration challenges, it is imperative for us to keep the conversation going, especially after this year's successful meetings, including the IMRF in New York, the Global Diaspora Summit in Dublin, and the GCM Champions Ministerial Meeting in Rabat. The IOM should align its priorities and programs to the GCM and the Progress Declaration which provide clear mandates and guidance on the ways forward. The IOM should work with the UN development system to ensure coherence, efficiency, and synergy in the multilateral space. The IOM has an important niche of coordinating the international community to reduce vulnerabilities of migrants in all stages of migration from recruitment to reintegration. These include enhancing irregular pathways for migration and combating trafficking in persons and illegal recruitment, putting in place humane alternatives to pushbacks and externalization to prevent loss of lives and human dignity, encouraging multilateral and bilateral cooperation to address issues such as labor policy reforms, humane treatment of migrants, ending wage theft, providing decent workspaces, and extending social protections and social security entitlements for migrants, and finally, supporting more programs to help governments create opportunities for and ensure seamless reintegration of returning migrants in their home countries. <clears throat> in confronting these tasks, we should not be remiss in responding to needs of all people, <coughs> especially groups in vulnerable situations, including women and children, indigenous peoples and persons with disabilities. Madam Chair, we assure you that the Philippines will remain an active participant in IOM mechanisms, including here in International Geneva, where our migration community plays a key role in shaping IOM governance and management. Our aspiration is to continue to pave the way towards a lean, action-oriented, inclusive IOM, compassionate and responsive to the plight of migrants all over the world. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And I now give the floor to Belgium. Madame la Présidente. Madam Chair, first of all, I'd like to thank the Director General and his teams for the holding of uh, fruitful bilateral consultations in October. We had an opportunity to review and evaluate our existing cooperation and look at possibilities for improving it. We, take, we took the floor last year by highlighting the added value of the IOM in terms of the fight against the pandemic, which had affected us all 
between 2020 and 2021. Thanks to its flexibility and uh, rapid reaction capacity, IOM and all of its staff were able to be an essential link in the joint response to the healthcare crisis we all faced. Just when the world was coming out of this challenge, the war of the unprovoked aggression, which is unjustified and unjustifiable by Russia in Ukraine, put once more humanitarian capacities at uh, serious, under serious pressure. This uh, aggressive war against ag Ukraine has put on the road millions of people and provoked an unprecedented movement of refugees and internally displaced people at the doors of the European Union. These effects are not only felt in Ukraine and its uh, direct neighbors, but also through food security issues uh, far beyond this in countries that are already hard hit by climate change. Once more, the IOM and its uh, flexibility and rapid reaction abilities meant that it was able to play a determining role. We'd like to thank the IOM for its activities under the flash appeal, and we're very happy to have been able to contribute to 3 million euros. The war in Ukraine, Ukraine is uh, only increasing global instability that we already know, and it's necessary that we develop a multitude of tools to limit its effects. The recent visit of our Prime Minister to Ukraine and the announce of further support to the work carried out by the IOM in the field for Ukrainians shows our full support and our confidence in the work of our organization, and that even more importantly, because winter is at the door. So my delegation would like to thank and congratulate the IOM for its, multi, for its multifaceted approach to ensure the security and well-being of migrant populations through its action and its support, both in countries of origin, in countries of transit and destination. The many projects put into place by our organization contribute actively to strengthen the triple net nexus by achieving the sustainable development goals as well as making clear the mutual benefits of safe, orderly and regular migration. In its role as a coordinator of the United Nations Network on Migration, IOM has an important influence on the implementation of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration. And Therefore, Belgium thanks uh, the IOM for the leadership that it has developed and uh, welcomes the adoption of the Declaration of Progress at the International Migration Review Forum in May. Belgium fully subscribed to the work of this forum and is proud to have participated with a large delegation reflecting the guiding principles of the compact and showing the value that we give to this reference document. Uh, Madam Chair, Director General, in order to fulfill its various missions, it's necessary that our organization have available the structural and financial means that are suitable. Therefore, my delegation highlights the importance for member states of ensuring that in a timely manner they provide their assessed contributions and calls on all states to act accordingly. It's essential for my delegation that the financial model of our organization is sustainable. Belgium thanks each state for the efforts made collectively which have allowed us to achieve a consensus solution in the budgetary room reform at the uh, 30th meeting of the SCPF. Uh, we also welcome the leadership and the significant work carried out by the high level management of the IOM, its bureau, and in particular Costa Rica. This helped us reach the necessary consensus. This consensus is nevertheless not a panacea. We still have to find uh, solutions that allow us to fill the financial gap, uh, which is quite significant, in order to allow the IOM to have the necessary resources to accomplish its missions. Therefore, Belgium calls once more for an increase of non-earmarked uh, 
funds uh, for the budget of our organization. My delegation repeats uh, its call on member states to contribute to the essential structures of the IOM, just as uh, the Belgium does uh, with 1 million euros a year. And to conclude, Belgium is happy to take an active part within MOPAN as a co-institutional lead in the exercise, along with Canada and the Netherlands. The previous evaluation was one of the main sources of identification of the reforms that were undertaken by the OM, and we are convinced that this new version of the MOPAN will be an opportunity to continue with our joint efforts to improve our organization. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now have the honor to give the floor to the distinguished representative of Malawi. Madam Chairperson, uh, before I make our national statement, I'm compelled to convey on behalf of the Malawi government our deepest condolences to the government and people of China for the loss of their former president, Jiang Zemin. Chairperson, on behalf of Malawi, I would like to convey our congratulations to His Excellency Ambassador Lansana Giberi in his election as chairperson of the Bureau. We appreciate the oversight and leadership of the outgoing uh, chairperson over the course of our previous deliberations. We are grateful also for the dedication of the Director General and the commitment of the entire IOM leadership. I take this opportunity to renew our support. In total alignment with the statement made by Nigeria on behalf of the African Union, the government of Malawi wishes to highlight, acknowledge, and appreciate the recent positive budget adjustments that ultimately benefit the ongoing projects worldwide, and particularly in Malawi. Malawi supports the IOM's newly engraved focus on the effects of climate change on migration. Malawi has most recently lost 30% of its electricity due to hydropower station damages caused by this year's tropical storm, Anna. This is but one of many examples of the effects of climate change uh, on the world economies. The lack of sufficient renewable energies results in further degradation of the environment, leading to further displacements. In Malawi's southern region, specifically along the lower Shire River, floods often result in internal migration and the disruption of national food security. Malawi subscribes to the Paris Agreement and the recent resolutions of COP27. Allow me to take this opportunity to thank our host member state, Switzerland, for being one of the first to implement carbon offsetting deals. Malawi is grateful to have benefited from such a deal signed at the COP27. Malawi would like to commend all member states here present for the collective efforts made to mitigate world migration challenges. I thank you. Thank you very much. And I now invite the Director General to his comments. Thank you so, so much, Madam Chair. Je veux tout uh, First of all, I would like to thank Tunisia for drawing our attention to several issues on managing migration, including how important it is for us to have data so that we can analyze these data. This is vital for us to be able to ensure that we have adequate migratory policies and strategies. We would like to underline that we are available to cooperate with the Tunisian government in defining a migratory policy that is based on the Sustainable Development Goals, as well as the Global Compact for Migration for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration. As regards the statement made by Mexico, we would like to underscore how important it is to have multilateral cooperation in migration, because there is no country that can act alone. 
no country alone can rise to the challenges presented by these increasing migratory lows. And that is why we, as the IOM, would like to welcome the leadership shown by Mexico in the working group on labor mobility within the framework of the Los Angeles Declaration on Migration and Protection. And we will continue to be available to work with and support Mexico in its work in the working group. And it has to be said that this year Mexico has also witnessed record levels. It has now become a country not only of transit but also a country of destination and this also creates challenges regarding how to manage these migratory flows at the IOM and Mexico continue working closely with the government of Mexico as well as working with local authorities in the country so that we can manage the migrants that are passing through the country as well as coming to the country focusing on respecting their human rights and providing support to them. I would like to emphasize uh, the critical role that the Philippines has played both in the implementation of the Global Compact but also in supporting and engaging in the steering committee of the Multi-Partner Trust Fund on Migration and uh, in supporting the adoption of the Progress Declaration in the framework of the International Migration Review Forum. And more recently, Philippines is a key player in the uh, assessment of the impacts of climate change in human mobility. The Philippines is particularly, has been particularly hit by natural disasters. IOM has been always in the front line in supporting uh, the Philippine authorities in coping with the impacts of those natural disasters, as well as in supporting and uh, making the case for the protection of the Philippines that work uh, abroad. As regards Belgium, I would like to also uh, welcome the bilateral consultations that we had this year in Brussels, which meant that I personally was able to go there to understand the very close cooperation between the FEDASIL and the IOM, as well as teams managing migratory flows in Belgium. We also would like to welcome the flexibility that has been shown by Belgium regarding financing, particularly regarding responding to the Ukraine crisis. And we hope that we will be able to increase our cooperation in uh, implementing the Global Compact as well as uh, developing humanitarian actions by the IOM. Just, uh, concerning Malawi, I want to express my thanks for the leadership of Malawi in the Migration Dialogue for Southern Africa, MITSA 2022, that adopted a very important resolution that paved the way also for a ministerial statement at the SADC level linking migration and uh, climate change. I think that we can always be uh, rewarded by that effort, by the decisions taken by COP27. And uh, you can go on counting on us with supporting to build capacity for disaster risk reduction policies and action plans, including early warning systems, being Malawi, one of the countries that have been more seriously hit by natural disasters last year. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And thank you all delegations for your statements in this morning. And um, I inform you that we will resume this general debate in the afternoon at 3 p.m. And we will now, after a very short technical break, uh, move on to agenda item 13, which is the panel discussion with a presentation on the launch of the Essentials of Migration Management 2.0. See you in a minute.
I'm gonna go. Oh, I didn't get the memo. Oh. I, I, I definitely. Tomorrow. I love it. Get we're complimentary it. Quellos, it's a real thing. <laughs> Excellencies, distinguished guests, colleagues, friends. It's my great pleasure to chair the next session on IOM's flagship training program on migration management, the essentials of migration management, or simply EMM 2.0. And since it is my first time of addressing the council, I will also use the opportunity, as other speakers have done, to congratulate the incoming chairperson of the, of the council to also appreciate the um, exemplary work of the outgoing um, chairperson, to also welcome and congratulate the newest member of the IOM family, um, Government of Barbados, and to also express sincere condolences to the Government of China on the passing of uh, late chairperson Jiang Jimin. And now we have with us a great group of panelists who will share with us their views and experiences. And I look forward to our conversation. But first, let me say a few words to introduce the topic. Capacity development at IOM is key for effective migration governance and migration management. The IMRF and post-IMRF pledges, which you all made, show not only a need for capacity development in countries, but also recognition of IOM's role as a crucial actor to capacitate countries in their efforts to develop effective rights-based migration management governance and management. I'm pleased to reassure you that IOM's capacity development efforts meet these needs by strengthening the complex framework of laws and partnerships that national and international institutions need to implement on all aspects of migration and as a crucial enabler for countries to reap the benefits of migration while upholding the rights of migrants. IOM recently developed a corporate methodology for capacity development, the CD4MM, Capacity Development for Migration Management. This guides IOM staff on how to provide comprehensive and systematic capacity development support to government and other migration management stakeholders for better impact, increased sustainability, and for an integrated rights-based approach to migration management. In concrete terms, this approach provides a common understanding and language to articulate IOM's work to support member states in strengthening migration management and governance capacity. It uses a holistic whole of government approach to capacity development it focuses on structural, organizational, and individual levels in capacity development, and is context-specific and tailored to the needs of each individual country and program based on needs assessment and impact scenarios. And it advances learning-oriented capacity development that complements existing structures and practices. Capacity development is comprehensive in scope, encompassing strengthening of organizations, the individuals working with them, and the systems or wider institutional environment within which they interact. It involves a wide range of technical and methodological expertise, going well beyond training. The EMM 2.0 is a pillar tool that can be employed along with a range of other IOM programs and methods in certain phases of the capacity development process. EM 2.0 that we are presenting today is one of the tools that falls under IOM's intensified efforts to advance sustainable capacity development. The program provides online resources 
and training modules for government officials and all other migration stakeholders. The EM, EMM 2.0 curriculum offers the most comprehensive catalog on migration management, from foundational topics such as international cooperation, international migration law, and the policy cycle, to the specific thematic areas such as migration health, youth migration, environment, and climate change. EMM 2.0 is also versatile and can be used to fill specific gaps. For example, following a migration governance indicators MGI review of a national or local migration system, support efforts to develop whole of government and whole of society approaches to migration in the context of a policy development process or as part of wider GCM implementation efforts. Because of this, EMM 2.0 has many uses. It can serve as an introduction to relevant staff and audiences to migration and migration management. It can also serve as a tool to capacitate government staff with migration governance and governance structures. Or it can be used very specifically as a springboard for deep dives into relevant thematic areas. We have seen very strong uptake by users around the world of the EMM program. More than 700 government officials have participated in EMM 2.0 trainings. More than 20 countries have already used the EMM 2.0 training to improve their migration management. And since May of this year, more than 250 users have created an account and begun modules, completing on average three to four modules each. These figures speak not only of a huge demand, but also show that different use modalities can, success, can successfully be leveraged to suit stakeholders' needs. In essence, EMM 2.0 is meant to offer guidance for effective migration management while allowing practitioners the freedom to respond intelligently to the challenge at hand. The focus throughout is on the search for practical answers and win-win solutions. As you will see and hear from our distinguished panelists, EMM 2.0 is a perfect tool in IOM's broader capacity development efforts to increase impact and sustainability. It's my strong hope that many of you and your colleagues will have an opportunity to experience the tool and institutionalize it in your work so we can all make the most of this tool and improve it through its continued implementation. And as I started with, we do have a great group um, of, of panelists here with us today. Let me start with um, Secretary, Minister Susan Ople from the Philippines Department of Migrant Workers. She will be joining us online from Manila. IOM is grateful to the Philippines for organizing an early pilot training on the EMM 2.0 in March 2020. And the valuable feedback of your senior officials has contributed to the finalization of IOM's flagship training and to make it an excellent tool for policymakers. I'm also pleased to welcome Ms. Stephanie Leung, Director of International Migration Policy from IRCC Canada. Canada has been the champion, the first EMM, and I'm grateful that 14 years later, you have trusted us again through seed funding and chairmanship of the group of friends for EMM 2.0 since its inception phase. I also introduce to you and wish a warm welcome to Director General Ambassador, Ms. Nerdan Eprolat Altuntas from Turkey's MFA. We commend Turkey's contribution to IOM, particularly to EMM 2.0, 
through the secondment of senior diplomats who have led the program to where it is now. We also thank the Turkish government for organizing the first EMM 2.0 online training, reaching out to 400 participants, including MFA consular officers and labor attaches working at Turkish missions from around the world. I'm also pleased to welcome Mr. Kurasha Shueni, Parliament Specialist from the Sadak Parliamentary Forum, who has been working closely with IOM to ensure the inclusion of migration matters within Parliament's body of work in the region, and is here with us to share his experience with the first regional training of EMM for parliamentarians. But just before we go to our panelists, I would like to give the floor to our Director of Department of Program Support and Migration Management, Monica Garacci, to give you a glimpse of EMM 2.0. Monica, you have the floor. Thank you, DDG. Um, fellow panelists, distinguished delegates, it's really a pleasure for me to introduce to you the uh, IOM flagship program on migration management, the EMM 2.0. You have or are about to receive on your desks a small QR code that gets you, hopefully, to the EMM portal <laughs> through your, your phones or, or a tablet. So we encourage you to uh, use it as we go through the presentation. And we have also a few copies of the catalog in the room if you want to have a look later on. So some of you may remember the original version of the program launched in 2004, bringing together for the first time what were considered the essential elements needed to address migration management in three large paper volumes. And since, since then, much has happened on both the international uh, migration governance landscape and the technological and digital fronts, which called for a new, integrated and modern approach to our flagship program. So in 2018, I started working on a 2.0 version of the EMM. In addition to providing targeted resources for specific thematic areas, the new program also highlights and facilitates the interactive use of these different thematic contents and helps looking at migration through a whole of government lens. The program also leverages cooperation at national, regional, and global levels while articulating the relevance of international frameworks such as the SDGs and the GCM in the day-to-day -day work of government officials and other stakeholders involved. The EMM 2.0's main program features are the handbook, the e-library, and the courses. And these materials are built on an interactive and easy to navigate e-platform, the emm.iom.int. By hosting online, EMM 2.0 content can be updated regularly and easily to reflect emerging trends in, in the field. So now to the EMM 2.0 handbook. This is really the foundation of the program. 30 online chapters provide brief and comprehensive overviews of different aspects of migration management. The program team engaged IOM thematic experts, external research consultants, academics, and government officials throughout the chapter development and revision process. And relevant UN agencies were also invited to provide additional layer of considerations so as to ensure overall synergy with the broader UN system. Such intensive handbook development and revision process was coupled with further internal vetting. All IOM departments, all IOM divisions and units were involved in the whole process. This way, EMM 2.0 strives really to offer a consistent approach to different areas of migration management in one coherent institutional voice. The program's table of contents is broken down into two parts. Part one, Foundations of Good Migration Governance and Management, provides a general introduction to contemporary migration as a human phenomenon, principles, social and economic determinants and impacts, and the legal, diplomatic, and administrative approaches that have been or are being elaborated in response to its emergence as a major issue of concerns at the national, regional, and international levels. And the second part, Q2, 
key areas of migration governance and management covers the main policy challenges faced by governments, including long-standing ones such as labor migration, social cohesion, smuggling uh, of migrants and trafficking in persons, as well as newer ones such as the mobility consequences of climate change. Then we have the EMM 2.0 e-library, which hosts a meticulously selected repository of resources offered by the IOM, other UN organizations, research institutions, and other entities, as well as interactive presentation of the IOM glossary. Access to the e-library resources is open to the public, conveniently broken down either per thematic migration area, like youth migration or migration health, for example, or by other searchable fields, including regional coverage, year of publication, and language. And the e-library is further organized by the type of resources as per the following, top five resources, key sources of data, research, and analysis, international law, initiatives and commitments, guidelines and training materials, reports and studies. The EMM courses can be delivered face-to-face, -face, online, or combined in a blended manner. This flexibility is particularly pertinent in the current context where participation in person, in in-person events has been really significantly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The 18 face-to-face -face training modules cover different aspects of migration management, including a facilitator's guide, presentation slides, learning handouts, and more. By the end of each face-to-face -face training, participants are expected to feel more empowered and taking action for improving their own migration policies by following the steps in the policymaking cycle. The overarching goal is to influence migration policy development and implementation and to promote collaboration within government, with other governments and beyond governments. For instance, with private sector, civil society and international organizations. And in addition to the face-to-face -face training, participants may want to continue their learning journey by enrolling themselves in EMM 2.0 self-paced e-learning courses. These courses are entirely free and are available all year long, providing immediate knowledge on demand. While the EMM 2.0 program was developed for government officials, IOM, UN staff members, the civil society, individuals from teaching and research institutions interested in the topic of migration can also partake in its self-paced e-learning modules. As of today, EMM 2.0 training modules have been successfully implemented in over 20 different countries, as the DDG mentioned the last training took place in Indonesia in September as part of a multi-partner trust fund project bringing together UNDP, UN Women and IOM. All materials are available in English. Selected training modules and handbook chapters are also available in French, in Spanish, Turkish, Bahaja, Indonesia and Arabic. And clearly our objective is to make uh, it's available in all languages, uh, and to this purpose, we're continuing our fundraising efforts to be able to conduct roll out of EMM 2.0 on a truly global scale. In total, more than 700 government officials have been trained on the essentials of migration management, thanks to the generous contributions from the State Secretariat for Migration Switzerland, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, the U.S. Department of State Bureau for Population, Refugees and Migration through the Western Hemisphere Program, and from internal funds through the IOM Migration Resource Allocation Committee, the MIRAC, and the IOM Development Fund, the ADF. And finally, just to conclude from a structural point of view, the EMM 2.0 is, of course, a key component of IOM's institutional capacity development approach that was just mentioned by the Deputy Director General. So to foster greater inter and intra-departmental coordination as part of the structure reform, we created a coordination and capacity development unit in the Department for Program Support and Migration Management. This unit brings together the EMM 2.0 the capacity development for migration management, which is IOM's methodological approach to capacity development, and the ACBC, the African Capacity Building Center located in Moshi. 
these are the three units that for the moment compose this, um, the, the CCDU. The aim is to offer strategic methodological guidance and advisory support to IOM capacity development efforts across thematic areas and organizational levels so that all initiatives on the ground embed capacity development components. And we would like to thank the government of Denmark for supporting us with this work. So we look forward to the panel, to the interventions and to the discussion and uh, the team and I stand ready to uh, further discuss uh, in the weeks to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Monica. And without further ado, I'm very pleased to call on Secretary Susan Ople from the Philippines Department of Migrant Workers. Secretary Ople, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, IOMPTG, and uh, to all the IOM officials. Um, let me also greet uh, all your excellencies, distinguished guests, and um, uh, the members of the council. A warm mabuhay from the Philippines. I wish I could be there. I wish I, I could join you there, but um, so much uh, needs to be done here at home. But um, please allow me to also introduce myself. I am Secretary Susan Ople of the newly formed Department of Migrant Workers, or DMW for short. Um, we also, uh, let me also start by acknowledging um, IOM for uh, its launch today of the Fair and Ethical Recruitment Due Diligence Toolkit here in Manila, Philippines. So we are really very proud of the work of the IOM uh, here in the Philippines and across the world. Um, you know, uh, we have more than 40 years of experience in migration um, governance uh, in the Philippines. At present, we have around 10.5 million uh, migrants. 10% of our population um, is outside the country, with, uh, with around 4.22 million of them working as temporary migrants. The protection and promotion of the welfare of uh, uh, overseas Filipino workers, or OFWs as we call them, is mainstreamed in our governance work, uh, framework. Although our new department is in its infancy, the law creating this department will have its first anniversary on December 27 this year. Um, and our first ever national budget will be approved um, also within the month of December. So you can see we are that new. But migration governance has been in place in the Philippines since the 70s, early 70s. So our commitment to upholding the rights and welfare of our overseas workers is timeless and has been a constant theme across all presidential administrations. As Secretary of the DMW, I have every intention to uphold this commitment and put it in action on different and uh, several levels to ensure compliance with the 23 objectives of the UN Global Compact on Migration, the Philippines being one of its global champions. Now we go to the EMM. 2.0, which I would describe as the sweet knife of migration management and governance, information, and education. Um, I am an active user of the EMM, and um, I'm quite familiar with some of its uh, features. So again, let me thank the IOM and all the contributors for this vastly useful and relevant information tool. The Philippines has supported the EMM um, since uh, its inception through training programs with our top officials. It is aligned with the whole of nation approach that our country continues to adhere to when it comes to migration and migration governance. EMM 2.0 builds on past um, experiences and uh, uh, past 
knowledge and information by providing stakeholders with the tools for evidence-based policy making. I appreciate many of its features. Since the pandemic, I have been into e-learning and so having this as a, a digital learning tool is so useful and um, efficient, uh, especially as a secretary when I have so many uh, things to do and so many more to learn. Um, it is where relevant government agencies can download, which I have done, the World Migration Report 2022, which has an entire chapter, chapter nine, devoted to migration and the slow onset of the impacts of climate change. I appreciate, and if you can enter uh, EMM 2.0, you can read the testimonies of migrants on the multi-causal nature of climate migration. I know this very well. I have firsthand experience uh, with this because in my own hometown, uh, in Bulacan, which is along the coast of Manila Bay, um, I, I see with my own eyes how labor migration and uh, climate change have a um, convergence of sorts because most of our workers uh, are being driven by the lack of jobs and uh, economic opportunities um, caused by constant floodings in my own hometown. Even if there's no storm or typhoon, um, the, our hometown is flooded, even with the usual high tide um, occurrences. I also appreciate the course on trafficking in persons, which features the four Ps, prevention of human trafficking, protection of victims, prosecution of perpetrators, and partnership. If I may add, or if there's room for any suggestion, I would hope that there can be more testimonials and perhaps more information on online uh, or, or on human trafficking via social media platforms, which is, we are now experiencing here in the Philippines. Also, if there can be more information about how to work together as member states um, uh, following the principle of shared responsibility, when it comes to third country, illegal recruitment and human trafficking. Another sur suggestion that I wish to offer would be an inclusion on the impact of pandemics on migrants and on migration governance. For example, a recent IOM survey conducted here in the Philippines with more than 8,000 um, respondents uh, our returning OFWs affected by COVID-19 showed that wage theft arose um, and, and um, was uh, deeply felt and deeply experienced by our overseas workers during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this also was um, more felt by the women migrant workers, so gender issues also come into play. Um, I hope that uh, there, there can also be a, a chapter uh, to be included uh, under communicating uh, uh, migration in, in crisis situation, uh, perhaps a chapter on, on crisis management when it comes to um, uh, any pandemic of sorts. Uh, I I, um, I recall how confusing it was when COVID-19 uh, hit an international cruise ship. I hope you, you, you still remember that. And we were all confused. Uh, we had some seafarers, Filipino seafarers aboard that uh, ship. And there was much confusion as to who was in charge, who was to be held accountable, who should be caring not just for the passengers, but also for the crew that had to keep working in order in order to make uh, these uh, passengers comfortable at great risk to the lives of these seafarers. The good news is that we already have 
this Swiss knife available for all of us, for all of us who are students, um, perpetual students of migration um, in any shape or and form. Um, we merely have to do our share as co-authors, as contributors in keeping EMM 2.0 constantly updated. This is a role that all of us can play as stakeholders, as keen observers of how the world moves and how people, uh, people mobility um, takes place. I look forward to more chapters and courses and knowledge products and enhancements within and across EM 2.0. We live in an ever-changing world. Um, global recession is looming. We have an aging population. We have uh, wars, even undeclared wars, trade wars, cyber wars, all kinds of conflicts going on. And yet, we need to rely on each other in order to understand this ever-changing world better. And so, my dear friends, our education is for life. So thank you and congratulations once again to the IOM, the leadership of the IOM, its entire staff for giving us this remarkable EMM 2.0 platform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency, for your remarks. We've taken very good note of your, um, uh, your recommendations and also very pleased to hear that you see the value of EMM 2.0 in the context of a Swiss, uh, a Swiss Army knife, which um, gives many, um, many different tools for, for different uses that can be applied as best suited in a particular country context. Thank you very much. And now we move on to our second panelist, and I have the pleasure of introducing the Director of International Migration Policy, Ms. Stephanie Leung, Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada. Ms. Leung, you have the floor. Thank you, DDG Daniels. Je suis heureuse de participer à la. I'm very happy to participate in today's discussion. discussion to support the um, essentials of migration management. Migrants are talented and qualified, and they enrich societies. They contribute to economic growth, and according to uh, Canada's experience, the advantages of migration, which is well managed, have never been so clear or significant. It's not by chance, but by choice, that we host an ever-growing number of migrants. In 2021, we received more than 405,000 new arrivals, the largest number we've registered in a single year. For 2022, we've increased our goal to 431,000. Our forthcoming plan on migration levels, we will continue to add and increase our goals to reach 500,000 by 2025. These figures add to the hundreds of thousands of temporary workers and international students and others who come temporarily to Canada. Regular pathways to Canada and settlement services, where policymakers, partners, operation teams, settlement service providers, and other enablers, including IT experts in digitalization, work together to move policy into implementation, each applying their expertise. The IOM is an important partner for Canada in the delivery of migration and resettlement services, capacity building activities and humanitarian assistance, stabilization activities, and for longer-term development investments. Canada values the IOM's responses to the needs of the most vulnerable. Canada also commends the IOM for its work dedicated to putting into action the principle of safe and orderly and regular migration benefits of countries of origin, transit, and destination, and of course, migrants themselves. Strengthening migration systems is a key objective of Canada's approach 
to international capacity building as it ensures that states and stakeholders have the appropriate information and resources needed to advance migration governance. Canada has been involved with EMM since its inception, including during the design of the original version. We provided seed funding for its development, the testing of the various modules, and some of EMM's 2.0's early work. EMM 2.0 is primarily a tool to support capacity development in countries to ensure that they can create a policy environment that is rights-based and meets their interests and needs, as well as international commitments like the international the Global Compact for Migration, and the Sustainable Development Goals. Subsequently, we have had the, the honor of chairing the Group of Friends, which brings together over 20 representatives of Geneva-based permanent missions to initiate informal discussions, including suggestions, just like you've heard, to ensure that EMM 2.0 is designed in a way that is fit for purpose and relevant to member states. We are pleased to see how far the ION has advanced this work. EMM 2.0 builds on a holistic understanding of migration management and governance. It sets out in clear language the building blocks of migration policymaking in an informed and coherent manner. I will also take the example of labor mobility, just like um, the Secretary from the Philippines. EMM 2.0 gives a snapshot of the variety of ways that labor migration takes place now and a sense of current trends. If your QR code worked, you could see it on your mobile phone and you can actually type in labor mobility and follow along. It has links to key sub-themes like ethical recruitments and migrant worker protection rights. Then EMM 2.0 also has a section built in on interlinkages, pointing to health-related considerations, COVID-19, and of course labor mobility and climate change, so that it moves beyond the fundamentals, and I find that very exciting. And you can also layer on other considerations that are of hot topics these days, including gender responsive migration policymaking or specific considerations regarding youth. Then it gets into the cross-cutting themes, um, of course, reminiscence of the GCM. And this information is all accessible online right now and at a glance, quite literally. And if such a snapshot can give and put this knowledge at your fingertips, then consider what EMM 2.0 courses, training, library resources can do, all to strengthen migration literacy for policymakers, for those delivering programs, for partners, uh, non-state actors, and really to enrich those engagements and our dialogues. In terms of reach and accessibility, EMM 2.0 has the benefit of being hosted online, accessible again by mobile phone, tablets, or other devices. And really, such flexibility is expected and particularly relevant since the pandemic and experiences that we've had, where we should and we can leverage online tools where they are needed and when they are needed. And being on online has the additional benefits of being able to be regularly updated to reflect emerging trends in a timely and proactive way. Yet, of course, we know that one size does not fit all. And before delivering training, EMM 2.0 also works together with countries and regional offices to ensure that materials are contextualized. And of course, training materials are most effective when they're designed and communicated in ways that keep their audience in mind. And EMM 2.0 follows this principle. Another element of effective um, knowledge materials is having the support of the community itself, the community that benefits from this work and can apply the training in concrete ways. Canada has been pleased to host a number of meetings of the Group of Friends, which has been established in uh, 2019 to make sure that EMM 2.0 is designed in ways that are impactful, sustainable, and relevant to member states. The group has gathered to provide feedback and suggestions on program design, including focused discussions on the self-paced e-learning modules and on hands-on user tests of the platform, we have offered suggestions to enhance the navigation of the websites, which has been incorporated in the final design. Canada recognizes that the group remains keen to grow the uptake of this training, all the resources online, and of course to have more users. We want to increase that number that Didi Jean Daniels mentioned at the beginning, more than 200 users logging in. For those member states who have used EMM 2.0 on its training, 
I invite you to reflect on your experiences and on how we can work together to make it more widely used and, of course, applicable to your immediate needs and future needs. We also encourage member states who are not as familiar to take a closer look online and consider how this training and the resources can help strengthen capacity within your own systems. Finally, I would like to thank the IOM for its global leadership on capacity developments uh, related to migration management and for all its efforts in developing this flagship training program. I would also like to reiterate Canada's support for EMM 2.0. Canada is committed to sharing this resource with others, both within and outside Canada, and we will continue to point to it as a comprehensive and user-friendly platform for learning and training on migration management. I'm a huge proponent of training and learning, and this really speaks to this learning-oriented approach um, to strengthening uh, migration management. We should ensure that EMM 2.0 is actively used to inform policymakers, raise public awareness, and dispel any anti-migration narratives through evidence and fact-based information. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Long, for your remarks um, and for showing how um, EMM 2.0 can be contextualized. Thank you also for the unwavering support of uh, the Government of Canada. In, in IOM, we often talk about journeys, and you've been with us on this journey from inception until um, now. So, so thank you very much. And now it is my pleasure to introduce um, our third speaker, Director General Ambassador Ms. Nerdan Erprolat Altuntas from Turkey's MFA. Ambassador, you have the floor. Uh, Ms. Deputy Director General, um, fellow panelists here and also the, the Philippines, uh, we are online. Excellencies, uh, colleagues listening to us here, here and also via online link. Um, but it's a great, great pleasure for me to be here today and speak about Turkey's support to IAM flagship training program on migration management. And I wish to thank uh, IAM for having me as a panelist here. Um, well, we have a long-standing and very fruitful relationship with IAM for more than three decades. Uh, in fact, IAM Turkey is one of the biggest country missions uh, of IAM. I think it's the second. Um, as the country hosting the highest number of refugees since 2014, uh, we always attach importance and rely on the close cooperation with UN bodies. Um, indeed, Turkey has a long history of history and experience as a crossroad for migration, and we are proud to be a leader country uh, in providing opportunities for refugees and migrants to live better lives. We uh, also have an, another side of the experience as an origin country with millions of uh, our citizens living in Western Europe contributing both to their country of residence and to Turkey as well. Uh, as the UN Secretary General has stated, making migration work for all means we need good partnership to ensure safe, orderly and regular migration. Given the complex and cross-border nature of migration, international cooperation and solidarity are indispensable in finding political solutions to common challenges. Uh, in this regard, um, Turkey has a wealth of experience to share with the international community. And IAM, together with UNHCR, is, uh, they are particularly important in this sense. And we have extended our full support to the GCM and UN Network on Migration since in its inception. We also commend DG Vitorina uh, for his role of, as coordinator. And we are looking forward to strengthen our cooperation as champion country. Today, uh, make migration work for all is a challenging but urgent task, I should say. Partnerships and capacity development are crucially important. We believe that IAM's Essentials of Migration Management Program, that's a comprehensive, informative, and insightful tool, provides us with an important opportunity to further our efforts. It touches upon every aspect of migration from all perspectives, and we believe that establishing strong synergies between EMM 2.0 and UN Network on Migration would be extremely valuable. The program has filled an important gap on providing fundamental knowledge on migration management. Uh, EMM 2.0 does not seek to prescribe 
a one size fits all. It's been said actually even before, which is exactly why we praise this tool. It offers guidance based on good practices that have been found to be broadly helpful over time with the whole of government and whole of society approaches. Uh, and I'm happy underline, to underline that Turkey has contributed to the development of this unique training program since its inception. Uh, we have been seconding senior Turkish diplomats to the IM headquarters since 2012. And one of our uh, second months, uh, she also contributed even uh, from the very beginning of this program. I would like to thank her as well, Özlem Kural. Uh, and all of our uh, second months, we believe that they served as program manager of EMM 2.0 and they played a key role in the development and implement implementation of this program. And uh, during the pandemic period, we also needed a kind of innovative learning method. So we used webinars and we organized a blended EMM 2.0 uh, training implement implementation last year. I also participated myself uh, with three cascaded webinars, a total of 400 participants from uh, uh, 120 missions of ours in 58 countries, uh, including Minister of Foreign Affairs, Councillor Officers, and also Labour Attaches from the Ministry of Labour and Social Security, working at Turkish missions abroad, uh, were trained on different aspects of migra uh, migration management with a particular focus on three modules, global context of migration, labour migration, and trafficking in persons. These modules offer direct linkages to the implementation of Turkey's policies, uh, that aim to manage irregular migration via comprehensive human rights and evidence-based and effective policies, as well as to mitigate the negative impacts. Additionally, the modules were con contextualized with the national data, as well as programs and strategies, and participants were able to attend uh, with their own paces. They were provided with self-paced learning materials that were complemented by a facilitated online webinar. This way, we have been able to reach out all our consular staff and labor attaches around the world with a whole of government approach. This training has served as a refresher for all of us and a platform to answer their practical questions about migration issues they are facing during their day-to-day -day work. Uh, I'm pleased to stress that we received strong positive feedbacks. I think I am also. Actually, you did. 95% uh, of participants expressed their satisfaction and they found the content relevant to their work. Uh, comprehensive and detailed presentations were made, reliable and ex extensive data on migration. The competency of experts, uh, not only mine, but others especially, delivering the training were among the most liked dimensions highlighted by our trainees. Uh, and the participants were also saying that they would like to have more. They would like to have willing, they are willing to receive additional training on migration management. I once again thank uh, IAM for having enabled such a useful, convenient tool. Uh, and we are pleased that Turkey has also contributed to this um, from the very beginning. And we would like to be happy to cooperate further in organizing uh, similar events. Uh, and. Since I'm here, let me also briefly touch upon our efforts and policies in migration management area. I would like to first demonstrate the size of irregular migration pressure Turkey has been facing. I have already mentioned that we have the highest number of refugees since 2014. Uh, it is uh, 3.74 uh, million people and also every year we apprehend new uh, irregular migrants. Uh, for example, uh, in the first nine months of this year, we apprehended 240,000 irregular migrants. Uh, and to give an idea, according to the Frontex data, the number of irregular migrants apprehended at or within EU borders is 288,000. So it's almost the same. The irregular migration pressure faced by Turkey is almost as comparable to the entire EU's pressure. This requires enormous effort, I should say, and resources by the whole government. Turkey has initiated a comprehensive legislation and organizational effort in the field of migration management, and we enacted a new law on uh, foreigners and international protection, and we also we would like to reiterate our gratitude to 
IAM because they also helped us. They contributed to the development process of this law. We established a migration board comprising all relevant ministries and institutions, and we also finalized our national migration strategy. The strategy prioritizes effective management of regular migration, successful combat uh, against irregular migration, effective international protection, fight, fight against human trafficking, and strong inst institutional capacity. We developed strategy documents and action plans on irregular migration, human trafficking, and integrated border management. The plans are reviewed by regular meetings with the participation of all relevant government bodies. In line with our migration strategy, we undertook an enormous capacity building effort within the relevant agencies, such as Presidency of Migration Management, as well as the law enforcement agencies. Uh, we also carried a comprehensive review of our visa policy since 2013. Uh, we enacted an e-visa system to facilitate business and tourism visas for eligible travelers. Uh, we have also been installing biometric data collection equipment in our missions. Uh, we currently collect biometric data in, our, uh, 50, in, in 58 countries. Uh, well, it is very important to ensure effective communication and coordination among all relevant government bodies uh, with a whole of government approach. And also it is important uh, to share the best practices among states. Uh, and we strongly believe it's essential uh, in enhancing bilateral, regional, and international cooperation. So I'm pl pleased to highlight the role of I am here. Uh, Finally, uh, addressing the drivers of migration are also very important, and it is um, also to give the opportunity for uh, irregular migrants or refugees to go back to their home countries, of course, uh, under desired conditions. So we manage, we are also uh, having uh, works on that. Uh, in northern Syria, we um, complemented 79,000 brick houses and 534,000 people uh, voluntarily returned now. So uh, it was a pleasure for me to attend this panel, and uh, I would like to reiterate our commitment to strengthen international cooperation with a view to better managing migration and protecting human lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for the remarks and sharing another example of how you have contextualized, it, contextualized EMM 2.0 in your, in your context uh, to support national policy implementation for all your missions uh, worldwide. And also, and let me express our deep appreciation for the for the secondments and and the strong the strong partnership. And now, last but not least, I'm pleased to welcome again Mr. Kurasha Shuneni, Parliamentary Specialist from the Sadek Parliamentary Forum. Mr. Kurasha, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I always. Um, start presentation by putting a disclaimer. I work for a parliamentary institution and the head of our institution is called the speaker. And uh, we therefore tend to like speaking. And uh, every time um, moderators will have tough time making sure that we stay within time, I will try hard. Um, I wish to recognize the IOM, IOM director general uh, the Deputy Director General. I also wish to recognize my fellow panelists, um, excellences and colleagues. I bring greetings from the Southern African Development Community Parliamentary Forum, SADAC Parliamentary Forum, which is the apex interparliamentary organization in the SADAC region, made up of 15 of the 16 national parliaments of SADAC member states. I tender sincere apologies on behalf of the Secretary General your Excellence Boyomo Sehoma would have wanted to grace the meeting, but could not do so due to other work commitments. The SADC Parliamentary Forum places on record its appreciation to the courteous invitation extended to it by the IOM to participate and make pre a presentation at this 
very august event regarding the SADC PF's collaboration with IOM on strengthening the role of Parliament in migration governance through its uh, regional office for Southern Africa. I'm elated to be speaking about the collaboration which is largely centered on building the capacity of parliamentarians to integrate and mainstream issues of migration governance through the rollout of the IOM's key capacity development tool, the Essentials of Migration Management, or EMM 2.0. I was privileged to be amongst the first cohort of uh, parliamentarians and staff drawn from across SADC national parliaments who participated in EMM 2.0 regional training for parliamentarians in Southern Africa. The participants were drawn from Botswana, Lesotho, Malawi, Namibia, and Zimbabwe, and uh, was made possible, the training was made possible through funding from the IOM Develop, uh, Development Fund and the U.S. Department of State Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration. Director General and uh, distinguished delegates, we found the EMM 2.0 useful to the work of parliamentarians for three reasons. Uh, firstly, uh, the training curriculum places emphasis on policy making and key drivers of migration and the relationship with migration governance. We liked especially the step-by-step -step approach to the process of developing and, implement and implementation of an effective migration policy and evaluation and the evaluation thereof. Secondly, the EMM 2.0 offers co a comprehensive catalog of training modules on different migration issues such as international migration law, human rights of migrants, gender, trafficking in persons, border management, and sustainable development. These are cross-cutting issues we deal with in, other, in our other areas of work. We cherished the fact that the EMM 2.0 team developed a tailor-made training based on a baseline survey among SADC parliamentarians. And finally, parliamentarians appreciated the interactive na nature of the training, which allowed for experience sharing and consensus building regarding migration management issues among MPs. We have uh, since developed a community of practice, caters of the training and MPs continue to exchange information on an ongoing basis. Our exposure to issues of migration uh, governance through the training immediately confirmed the relevance of parliaments in the SADC region and perhaps globally in supporting regular, orderly, and safe migration. As a result, of uh, the SADC PF has been working closely with the IOM Regional Office for Southern Africa to ensure integration of migration agenda in Parliament's program of work. Parliaments like, uh, um, in countries like Zimbabwe, Malawi, Lesotho, Namibia, and Botswana are at different stages of rolling out the training to members of relevant parliamentary uh, committees and staff. Director General and distinguished delegates, I wish to briefly highlight uh, what we have identified as the pillars um, that um, are opportunities which parliaments offer through their functions which uh, the partnership with IOM should capitalize to contribute to effective migration management. The first is uh, strengthening the legal framework for regular, orderly, and safe migration. Through its primary role of lawmaking, Parliament is a key um, in, ensuring, uh, that the exist in ensuring the existence of a legal framework that guarantees regular, orderly, and safe migration. Where there are legislative gaps, parliaments in most jurisdictions in Southern Africa are empowered to review existing legislation and align it with the regional and international normative frameworks. This also dovetails with the role of parliament in ratifying regional and international instruments to facilitate their domestication. There is also an opportunity through the oversight function. While traditionally the executive and judiciary branches have dominated the issues of migration governance, with parliaments playing a less prominent role, the reality is that parliament, through its oversight role, can ensure accountability in migration management, including uh, dealing with emerging issues such as climate change adaptation. Parliaments in the SADC region 
are incrementally becoming proactive in influencing public policy design and uh, implementation and outcomes. This has presented an opportunity for SADC PF to ensure deliberate integration and mainstreaming of migration governance issues in its work plans and those of SADC national parliaments, thanks to the capacity building uh, offered through the EMM 2.0 training. There is also a component of um, enhancing civic participation. Generally, international law is the law of nations, and unless if there is deliberate effort to involve citizens, they will remain sidelined. For regular, orderly, and safe migration to be realized, there is need for migration policy-making processes to be inclusive, especially by involving women and children. Parliamentarians provide the critical link between citizens and regional and international normative and policy frameworks for migration management. Um, another important pillar is ensuring protection of rights of migrants, especially women and children. With population movements across borders increasing in, in the Southern African region, the protection of rights of migrants, especially women and children, require regional cooperation. No single government can expect to reap migration benefits or address its challenges alone. The SADC PF experience already provides proves that national and regional parliaments can use their convening power to promote collaboration uh, by member states and non-state actors to address transboundary migration challenges that often trigger rights, rights violations for migrants and to find new creative and uh, effective solutions to the challenges. Another key aspect, budget allocation. Effective implementation of migration governance policies requires appropriation of adequate funds to the relevant government agencies mandated to handle these matters. When parliamentarians are capacitated and are knowledgeable about the critical importance of effective migration management, they are more likely to support pro-migration budgetary allocations. SADC national parliaments that have rolled out essentials of migration management training for relevant committees have started to witness MPs being supportive of pro-migration policies, including through budgetary allocations. The last aspect is uh, making, democracy work and, uh, making democracy and governance work. Perhaps the most critical aspect in terms of Parliament's contribution towards migration governance lies in Parliament's intrinsic role in supporting democracy and ensuring an effective, accountable governance. For safe, orderly, and regular migration to exist and be sustained, relevant state institutions must be uh, able to effectively perform their roles and do this in an accountable manner. The reality is that even if a country is getting its migration governance policies right, faulty governance often nullifies the impact. I wish to make a, a few recommendations. Uh, in view of the above, above, I wish to make the following recommendations to the IOM Council to consider for purposes of leveraging EM, EMM 2.0 in enhancing Parliament's role supporting effective migration governance based on SADC PF's experience through its collaboration with the Regional Office for Southern Africa, the IOM Regional Office for Southern Africa. The first one, sustain the capacity building of relevant committees and staff of national parliaments. The Regional EMM 2.0 training for SADC parliamentarians and parliamentary staff, uh, which was held in May, June this year, was a crucial first step. However, there is need to sustain the momentum by targeting the relevant committees and staff of parliaments who are, institutional, who are the institutional memory when individual members' tenure come to an end. The training is critical in empowering MPs and staff with increased knowledge on the ways to address dynamic uh, migration challenges and to maximize impact of migration as an engine for economic um, and social development. In the SADC region, the EMM 2.0 remains a valuable tool at the disposal of parliaments in their training of MPs and staff. The training of trainers is also an important strategy that was uh, buttressed in localizing capacity and ensuring sustainability. Uh, the other recommendation relates to deliberately integrating parliaments in migration governance processes. 
by virtue of their constitutional mandate in lawmaking, executive oversight, representation, and budget, parliaments are too critical a player to be left as an ad hoc, uh, 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 to be left in, uh, for ad, ad hoc engagement. Without involving parliaments, it is a daunting task often to have robust, comprehensive, and harmonized legal frameworks for migration governance. Equally, without the involvement of parliaments, it is difficult to ensure adequate domestic funding, ensure effective monitoring of the implementation progress, and guaranteeing genuine and meaningful public participation. We also need to leverage on parliament's role to narrow the implementation gap. There are also opportunities for parliament to engage parliament to ensure benchmarking and uh, experience, experience sharing um, the rights, uh, protection of rights through uh, protecting democracy and accountability uh, by parliaments. In conclusion, uh, Director General and uh, distinguished delegates, I wish to reiterate that uh, through sustained collaborative efforts and advocacy, in addition to improved knowledge on migration frameworks, SADC PF and national parliaments are committed to advocate for the ratification and domestication of key migration-related international instruments and protocols with a multi-stakeholder approach. Our ultimate objective is to make the SADAC region a place where there is a coherent, rights-based, and gender-responsive approach to strengthening migration governance. We look forward to continued collaboration with the IOM in this regard. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kurasha, for your remarks and for sharing the parliamentary approach, as well as the legislative action that the training on EMM 2.0 enabled um, for uh, participants in the SADC region. And we've also taken note of the recommendations. Thank you very much. Um, our uh, uh, the Honorable Secretary from the Philippines has had to leave, so I'll just use this opportunity very quickly to say thank you to her. And now we have, we're on the clock, we're meant to close by 1 p.m., but we have two statements from the floor, um, the delegate from Switzerland and the delegate from Mexico. So if I can ask... Um, uh, the speakers to please keep their remarks to three minutes each so that we're only taking one minute out of your, out of your lunch. And with that, um, the, uh, the formal panelists, uh, it's over. And now I will give the floor to the delegate from Switzerland. Thank you, DDG Daniels. I would just like to take the opportunity to congratulate the EMMM team for their great work and commitment. We are very proud and happy to support not only the development of the EMM 2.0 and its test phases, but also the translation to French. We consider the EMM an important tool, or as it has been called today, and we won't oppose, Swiss Army Knife, contributing to migration management. Its scope goes beyond generating skills and knowledge. It brings people together, as we could see during the face-to-face -face pilot trainings in Somalia and Ethiopia, for example. We invite member states to try the modules and trainings to get a good idea of how it works and consider contributing to its translation into more languages so more migration officials can be reached. Thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks and also for the continued support of the government of Switzerland to EMM 2.0. And also special thanks for keeping it below three minutes. Um, and now I hand over to the delegate of the government of Mexico. You have the floor. Gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Director General. I will be very brief. Uh, we would like to uh, thank you for organizing this panel. This is very important uh, for Mexico so that we can give visibility to this valuable tool, which has been said by the speakers. Uh, and it looks at uh, the national and regional capacities uh, for us to rise to the challenges as well as uh, to take advantage of the the benefits of migration. It is particularly relevant now that we as states uh, find ourselves uh, uh, making efforts to uh, implement uh, the global combat for migration in an accelerated uh, 
manner. We have different uh, tools, whether they are hybrid or digital tools, uh, and we use them to disseminate uh, the benefits uh, of these four decision makers and those that carry out these decisions. Uh, we believe uh, that uh, the, this is an effort that mutually reinforces uh, the Global Compact. And as we have been uh, saying in uh, the Group of Friends for the Initiative, uh, we would like to thank uh, the efforts that have been made by Canada. We believe that it is very important for countries to be proactively involved, uh, particularly those uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean. And we would like to welcome the increasing presence of uh, countries in um, the Caribbean, for example, including now uh, Barbados, because we, we are ever more present. Uh, Latin America has a particular migratory panorama and there is uh, a benefit to using this tool. We would like to ensure that uh, the contents of the courses and the other elements that are contained in the EMM 2.0 are also available in Spanish. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, delegate from the government of Mexico and also for keeping within, keeping it less than three minutes. But more importantly, and as you rightly mentioned, much appreciation um, to the group of friends and for all of the governments who have supported EMM to this stage and for their sustained um, commitment. Let me use this opportunity to ask you to join me in appreciating our very distinguished panelists who have really shared with us a diverse panorama of how they have applied EMM in their specific context and also to well, I don't think I have the authority to gavel, but for me to, <laughs> to also say that the um, session is closed and that you, um, we start again at uh, 3 p.m. So I wish you all bon appetit. And once again, thank you to our distinguished panelists.